today, a charged up drive to Goa for some authentic cuisine in the all electric Porsche Taycan. Road test the updated BMW X1 and take the QJ Motor SRK 400 for a quick spin. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Soini Datta. Being an automotive journalist surely has many perks. One, of course, being driving the latest and the most expensive cars launched in the country. And I will admit that it leaves some of our team members quite spoiled. So recently, Rohit was craving some authentic go in cuisine while sitting in Pune and he decided on a whim to drive down in the all-electric Porsche Taycan. Here's that story. Hi, I'm calling from uh, room 722. I was wondering if I could place an order for a prawns bal chow. Um, sorry sir, that's not available on our midnight menu. I'm really craving for one year. If you can just help me out with one portion. Unfortunately sir, that's that's not going to be possible. Is there anything else I could help you with? No, I think I'm fine. I know what I want to do. Porsche Taycan Turbo S. This is the car that I'm using for my travel. It may wear the turbo badge, but this is an electric and a grand touring four-door coupe at that. Oh, that acceleration. Oh my God. And the brakes. Ah, it's just brilliant. So, if you use launch control, it will go from 0 to 100 in 2.8 seconds. Under 3 seconds. But over half a second quicker than... Porsche Cayman GT4 RS. That car just blew my mind a few days back. This one goes quicker than that. The Turbo S puts out a staggering 625 PS, but that launch control boosts the performance to 761 PS, which goes down to the road via not one but two permanent magnet synchronous motors working in perfect harmony to create an impeccable all wheel drive system. For those of you who remember, we drove the Porsche Taycan Base last year. That's the one with the single motor. Now that uses a battery pack that has 28 modules made up of 336 cells. This one, the Turbo S, uses the Battery Performance Plus, which essentially means it has 33 modules and uses 396 cells. So with that kind of a battery size, you can easily have enough juice to satiate your need for speed and also your appetite for long distances. And speaking of appetite, we have about 350 more kilometers to go, which in a Porsche Taycan shouldn't be a problem at all. The Taycan devours miles like a hungry me, even when driving in the normal mode. There is a range mode too, which restricts the top speed to 100 kilometers an hour. But then what's the point of a Porsche? This EV is made for speed, and yet it delivers on the range it promises. So Taycan Turbo S supports up to 270 kilowatt DC fast charging. But as of now, in our country, you can only get between 30 to 60 kilowatt options more easily. And even there, you have to choose between some really known brands or maybe some new startups, some brands that you probably haven't even heard of, like this, for example. But there are big companies also jumping into this game. Shell is in the process of installing 120 kilowatt chargers across the country. Some of the car makers have started offering between 150 to 180 kilowatt options at their respective dealerships. So you see, the scene is getting better. The chargers are getting better. They are getting faster, which means road trips should be more fun, should be easier. 
As of now, the car is fully juiced up here in Kolhapur, which means the straight highways are almost about to end, which also means it's time now for the sport mode. But after that amazing drive, it's now time for the amazing food. This is what I'm here for. This is exactly what I was craving for. Prawns balchow, served in its typical cold plate form. And what better place to have it with? A beautiful view of the car, the ocean, the beautiful go in summer. It doesn't get better than this. drove to the slow tide restaurant in Goa for the perfectly made bal chow. It's a Portuguese delicacy introduced to Goa during the colonization. Made of stir-fried prawns added to a spicy, vinegary sauce. Simple ingredients, but ones that leave you with a fiery, long-lasting taste. Much like a Porsche. Well, the drive isn't over, but it's time to get back to the grind, which means I have to head back into the city today itself. So, we continue the journey. Thank you. Welcome. Back to the road. Honestly, I can't think of a better EV to serve my whim of driving all the way from Pune to Goa and back in the same day. It's got the performance and the range to fit every badge it wears. And by putting the turbo badge on an electric, Porsche have immortalized this sacred word even in the electrified future. It's been a rather fulfilling day, lovely food. And now talking about fulfilling, we are doing our last bit of fill up before we head back to the town. It's given me around 360 kilometers of real world range with a mix of highways and twisties and the kind of uh, roads that you saw. So I think that's a pretty good range for a car of this order. I genuinely did not think that I'll be able to do this, right? Leave the city, come here, have that lunch and go back. Of course, I did it on a whim, but well, the car has just done it. Even in today's times where we are still in a bit of an uncertainty with... Oh, wait, I just got a call. Hello? Good evening, sir. Hi, good evening, sir. I'm calling from the hotel. Yep, tell me. Uh, I believe you were inquiring about the prawns balchow uh, this morning. That's so correct. I would like to inform you that it's available now. So would you like me to book a table for you for dinner today? Uh, no, that won't be necessary. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Good night. What better way to celebrate 75 years of the iconic brand Porsche, right? We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll tell you all about the updated BMW X1. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. The third generation BMW X1 has been on our shores for the past six months. It is bigger than the previous generation model and is a lot more luxurious on the inside. But does it drive as well? Let's find out. This is the new BMW X1, the third generation model. Like the 2 Series Grand Coupe or even the outgoing X1, this one is based on the ULK2 platform or the Unterhaklasse platform in German, which simply translates to lower class. But then with a price tag of 45 to 50 lakh rupees, it's anything but lower class. But it is the most low cost crossover that you can buy from BMW at the moment. And I think this just might be the best buy in the segment. Is it? Let's find out. For starters, the U11 model looks bigger than the F48 or the second generation X1 that it replaces. It is almost as big as the first generation X5. And if I got a penny for every time people thought this was an X3, I could be able to afford a new X1 for myself. The pinched and sleek window line, which still has a bit of that Hofmeister kink, the long and the slim roof rails and the short overhangs enhance the sense of length while the 3D LED taillights that stick out from the bodywork add a perception of width. 
There are some expensive touches too, like the carpet lighting. The headlights are the adaptive LED type and have a brilliant throw and spread. The M Sport wheel also gets you paddle shifters behind the wheel. However, they are a bit of a reach, especially if you have smaller fingers. And speaking of reaching out, your co-passenger may find it particularly uncomfortable to reach out to the media or the navigation menus if you were to ask for their help. Because you see, like most BMW cars, the touchscreen or the dashboard is driver-centric. It's all angled towards the driver. Like most new BMW cars, most of the controls have now been put into the unintuitive iDrive system that they have been taken off, the physical buttons have been taken off. And unlike most new BMW cars, the jog dial has been taken out too. So once you've got your way around the infotainment and the different menus, you could easily use that jog dial. It was a convenient and a safe uh, tool to use all of that without really having to take your eyes off the road. But that tool has now gone missing with the new X1. The plus side to redesigning the tunnel console is more storage space. You get a floating upper deck which can house some knickknacks, a shelf below it for other small items, then there are two cup holders, two USB-C ports and a unique upright wireless charger. Then we come to the rear seat. Now the rear doors, they look a little narrow from the outside but ingress and egress is not a problem at all. In fact, this convenience is one of the reasons why you would choose a crossover over a sedan in this particular space. Now, in terms of the rear seat comfort, not too bad at all. I mean, the cushioning is quite good. I like the overall cushioning, not just for the bottom, but also for the back. The knee room is excellent. The driver's seat is set to my preference and just look at the kind of space it offers. This wasn't available in an entry-level crossover until a few years back, but now you get that in this space as well. Headroom, again, excellent. You get that panoramic roof, so it's a nice airy feel. You do get a center armrest, a floating type. You do get uh, two cup holders here as well. But like I said, the overall comfort is quite nice. But the party trick, especially with the M Sport trim, is that you also get 130 millimeters of recline for these seats. Even the boot volume is fairly large to accommodate a family's luggage. And a flat floor makes it easy to load and unload. I haven't driven the petrol variant of the new X1. However, looking at the kind of downsized engines that the Germans have been plonking in many of their cars now, I know that that petrol engine, despite what it says on the spec sheet, is going to be adequate. It is going to perform as expected. However, I also know that the size to price ratio is true not only for the exterior dimensions of the car, but also for the engine size, for the engine capacity. So, like the A-Class or the new C-Class, even for the X1, the diesel is going to be the better option. The diesel is a 2-litre, 4-cylinder turbocharged engine that is extremely refined and silent and you will have to look at the tachometer to know that this is a diesel. Though the 6000 RPM redline might still confuse you. Unlike some of the other BMW cars, it doesn't even say diesel on the fuel gauge. But it's a nice, silent, refined engine. So the tachometer is the only way to know that this is a diesel. But it's not just the refinement, even the power. This one puts out 150 PS compared to the 136 PS in the petrol. Now one of the things that the India Spec X1 misses out on is all-wheel drive. You do not get the X-Drive variants just yet. All you get is the S-Drive variants, whether you're choosing petrol or diesel which means that you get a front-wheel drive configuration. Now, like the 2 Series Grand Coupe, it is a very nicely tuned front-wheel drive configuration. Of course, it doesn't feel as nice to drive as an X3 or an X5, etc. But even for a front-wheel drive, it is quite nicely tuned. There is an assistance feature as well. So especially when you are driving around tight winding roads like these. Now, I am at moderate speeds, but if you were to go a little faster, start going a little quicker, start going hotter into turns, Despite being a front-wheel drive, with that assistance feature, it will try and make the turn-ins as tight as it can and get you a good control over the car. The sport mode will also make the diesel powertrain punchier still, making it feel like a 150 PS car. 
another area where the diesel engine again pips the petrol is the 0 to 100 times as well. So that higher power, higher torque actually translates to half a second quicker outright acceleration. What you also get with this 7-speed ZF DCT transmission is a boost mode with the paddle shifters. Simply long press on the downshifter paddle and it will engage the boost mode which lets the powertrain remain in its power band for 10 seconds to help you get that strong serving of power and torque to pull a quick overtake or barrel down a straight road at speed. So like I said, be it ride quality on poor road conditions, be it handling around winding roads, be it sure engine performance from the diesel of course, be it sure cabin size, be it cabin comfort, be it creature comforts, be it features, be it safety features, in all these departments, the X1 actually pips all of its competition. And while doing all of that, it is still priced very competitively against all of them. So you see, there's no reason why I shouldn't call this the best in class. On that note, it's time for us to take our final break here on the show, but come right back because on the other side, we tell you all about the new QJ Motor SRK 400. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Up next, we have a motorcycle which is new to the 400cc menu in the Indian market. It looks like an absolute treat, but does this delicious looking Chinese order leave you hungry for more? Let's find out. <laughs> All right, guys, so we're out here today with the SRK400. This is one of the four motorcycles that QJ Motors, the Chinese manufacturer, launched in India just last November. Now, this motorcycle retails for 3,59,000 rupees ex showroom. And as you can tell by the looks of it, it's really mean and aggressive. But does it have the go to match the show? We are about to find out. It would be easy to mistake the SRK400 as a lean and mean member of the green Japanese team. It's got that sleek, aggressive look all over, from the chunky front tyre with its twin discs, down to the brawny hunched forward tank and midsection, through to the sculpted seat, back to the wide, flattish tail. The exposed trellis frame with the offset monoshock looks great. And the underbelly exhaust keeps the mass of the motorcycle visually very central. All neat and tidy there. What caught me by surprise though with this Chinese model was its level of fit and finish. Because from the paint to the quality of plastics, this bike feels solid and put together really well. On the features front, this QJ motor bike gets just about what you could term as a decent amount of functional features like LED projector lights, DRLs and backlit switchgear. But what doesn't really match up to the modernity of it all is that rather simple looking LCD screen which reads out just basic information. No fancy Bluetooth connectivity or keyless functioning gimmickry here. But you do get dual channel ABS which is calibrated quite well. One of the main highlights of this machine has to be this parallel twin engine. It's 400 cc, liquid cooled. 8 valves, that means 4 valves per cylinder. Man, this engine is a real treat. Now, it makes around 41 PS of maximum power and around 37 Nm of max torque. And although it's not the most powerful engine out there in the market, well, its way of functioning out in the city is just so tractable. You can pull away from around 40 kph in 6, that's top cog. And out on the highway, revving through the gears, banging through that gearbox. Man, it's so smooth, refined, and it really wants to go for it. It's just so fun and enjoyable that you'll really have a blast with this machine. The moment you fire the SRK400 up, you can tell of this engine's potency. While the clutch is light and allows you to get off the line cleanly, when you open the throttle expecting enthusiasm, the SRK400 does anything but disappoint. The numbers on the digital dash climb in a rapid manner, and the sweet sound of that stock underbelly exhaust acts as the proverbial cherry on top. You'll want to hold on to each gear just to hear that sweet sounding wail of excitement. And the shove does feel grand. This twin cylinder definitely shows off its potency surprisingly well. Although the SRK400 is a bit on the hefty side, weighing in at 186kg curb, well it doesn't feel like a real task managing this bike about in the city. And it isn't a real hassle out on the highway either. 
But if you're the spirited riding sorts who's just taken a ride on one of the KTM 390 Dukes, well this one definitely won't feel as sharp and agile on the trot. Out here, your riding posture is slightly more relaxed and it isn't as aggressive as something like on its main rival, which is the KTM. Still, the chassis and the suspension holds up very nicely at pace and the bars aren't as far wide apart. So, riding over fairly long stints won't be really tasking on your palms and back. The front brake could do with a better initial bite and feel and you'll have to get a good hold of that front lever to get the front to react the way you expect it to, which was a bit upsetting of course considering that there are two 260mm discs up front. Alright, now to sum things up out here with the SRK400. Is this motorcycle worth the asking price of 3.59 lakh rupees ex showroom? Well, for, for most part it is because, well, just the way it looks, the way it's built, the way it's all put together, it really feels like a good quality product. Not only does it look great, but it really has the go to show as well because that engine, man, it's a real treat. Not only in the city, but out in the open highway. It's just so fun and entertaining. It might not be the most agile of machines out there, but man, you will have a real blast with this one. But the only downside is it does come with a couple of shortcomings because yes, first and foremost, it is lacking a certain amount of features. Uh, the screen, not all that great. It is a bit simplistic for my liking given its price tag. But more importantly, it is lacking the space behind you for your pillin and your luggage. With that, it's a wrap on this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. And you can follow our latest updates on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, drive and ride safe.